and it's a great privilege to welcome him back onto the mother of all talk shows again. Dr. George, thank you uh, for joining us. Let's start with the dramatic developments uh, in Moscow. Uh, what could possibly go wrong now that Kiev is landing uh, bombs in the center of Moscow? Well, what indeed? Well, obviously, um, Ukraine is uh, desperate for uh, escalating this war because ultimately the only way uh, it can hope to prevail is through U.S. military intervention. And so that's obviously what it's going for as it uh, launches these attacks on Moscow or wherever. Um, it's clearly hoping for some kind of a major um, escalation on Russia's part that could provoke um, Washington to do something. I don't think that would work. Um, however, there is a real danger that um, Washington could yet be provoked into getting directly involved. I don't think it's so much the um, uh, the sort of terrorist attacks on uh, on Russian cities, but more through the activities of Poland. Poland has become the rabid dog of Europe and is very anxious to provoke some kind of an incident with Russia in the hope of, again, triggering NATO's famous Article 5. So an attack on Poland is an attack on all, and therefore everyone must go to war uh, on Poland's behalf. So I think that's probably at the moment where the greatest danger lies in terms of uh, direct NATO intervention. Let me detain you on that point. Uh, it is one of the greatest historical ironies, is it not, that the Banderaite regime in Kiev, which collaborated, Bandera was the right-hand man of the SS and the Einsatzgruppen, who massacred well over a million people in the Holocaust of the East, many of them, most of them, Polish, that the Polish government is now in double harness with the supporters of, the descendants of, those who mass murdered Poles. How's that for an axis? It is a, a, an extraordinary event because, of course, as you say, um, the massacres in Volhynia were absolutely uh, horrific. Um, but the strange thing about um, Poland, and, and I don't claim to be, you know, uh, to understand this wholly, is that the Polish hatred towards Russia is far more intense than its hatred towards Germany. I mean, it does hate the Germans, but nothing to the extent that it hates the Russians. And by the same token, it doesn't hate the uh, Ukrainians, uh, anything with the intensity that hates the Russians. Now, what should also say that the Poles treated the Ukrainians uh, very badly during the late 1930s, during the forced uh, Polonization campaign. I mean, Poland seized this territory uh, from Russia in 1919, 1920, uh, um, while Russia was absolutely preoccupied with the civil war. Um, so Russia was forced to sign this agreement, the Treaty of Riga, 1921. So Poland grabbed itself a big chunk of territory and treated the inhabitants very badly, which I think you know uh, contributed to the, the subsequent um, bad treatment that was meted out to the Poles. But nonetheless, the extraordinary thing is that Poland has this animus towards Russia, and then Putin pointed out correctly is that that you know yes, Poland lost some territory uh, uh, in the east, um, but it was more than compensated by huge uh, rewards of territory in the west. You know the, the parts of uh, East Prussia and West Prussia and so on. So Poland should be rather grateful to uh, the Soviet Union for essentially restoring a big country after World War II, not to mention the fact that the Soviet Union liberated Poland from uh, Nazism. But nonetheless, the, the Poles absolutely loathe the Russians with, 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 an ex with an intensity far greater than the Germans, the ones who actually enslaved uh, Poland. It's a, it's a mystery, and I, can't, I don't fully understand it myself. I attended uh, an event uh, in Poland, in Warsaw, uh, in the last uh, day or so, uh, and 
it became clear to me that there are actually rather a lot of Polish people who don't approve of their country being dragooned, and it's willingly being dragooned by the political leaders, uh, into being the spearhead against Russia. Uh, they think that no good uh, can come of it. And moreover, there's a real fear uh, that martial law will be declared in Poland, at least in part of Poland, and that that will be used to cancel the upcoming elections in the country. What can you tell us about that? Well, that's a distinct possibility um, because Poland right now is whipping up an extraordinary uh, fervor against uh, Russia. Um, it's pretty much like you know on the, they're moving onto a war footing. Um, they've escalated their military spending. It's I think something like five percent of GDP, so well over what any anyone uh, demanded of, of NATO. Um, it's getting all of its arms uh, from the United States, so it's not even bothering with the, the EU defense industry. And uh, they've told uh, the United States that we are your strongest, your most loyal ally in Europe. Forget old Europe, forget Germany, forget France. Uh, you know, they're weak, insipid, decadent. They did all these terrible deals with Putin. We are the, the strongest, uh, you know, we are the most vigorous uh, part of Europe, and we will be, you know, your uh, foot soldiers in the coming war against Russia. It's an extraordinarily belligerent uh, rhetoric that's coming out of Warsaw. But uh, you're right. I mean, I, I talk to Poles as well, who are very sensible, very reasonable, who, who don't want to get dragged into uh, a, the stupid war. But Poland's leaders are not like that. So it's, whether it's Donald Tusk or whether it's uh, Radek Sikorsky or whether it's uh, Morawiecki, I mean, or, or Kaczynski, the leaders, they are all absolutely demented uh, in their, uh, the, their anti-Russian uh, hatred. Now, uh, leaving aside the uh, Eastern European theater for a moment, though, I'd like to come back to it. Uh, these were extraordinary scenes in St. Petersburg over the last few days, weren't they? No one could have expected yes. this African mm -hmm. Renaissance to be picking up the momentum that it has and the closeness of African countries now to Russia and China is quite extraordinary, isn't it? Absolutely. And it's very interesting that um, uh, Putin uh, brought up the names that you mentioned, you know, Ben Bella, uh, Nasa, Nkrumah, uh, Lumumba, Samora Machel. And, and he actually said that, well, you know, the Soviet Union uh, did a great deal for, to liberate uh, the, country, the peoples of Africa, you know, a great deal to fight against colonialism, neo-colonialism, great deal to fight against apartheid. And then he said, at the time, this wasn't really that popular a policy um, uh, within the Soviet Union because people were feeling, well, why are you giving all this stuff to Africans? Well, you know, we, we could use some of this ourselves. But then he says, well, actually, the Soviet Union made a very uh, sound investment because now, years, decades later, these Africans come to us and they are very grateful to us and are very well disposed towards us and uh, I want to help us precisely because of that long record of uh, Soviet assistance uh, to Africa uh, during those uh, decades. And it's very interesting that Gorbachev, who kind of tossed away the Soviet Union, the Soviet legacy <laughs> and everything, you know, over a kind of a boozy lunch with um, Helmut Kohl, um, didn't really realize he was he had so absorbed the Western view of the Soviet Union, he didn't realize that for much of the rest of the world, they didn't see the Soviet Union in the same way. They didn't see it in this sort of communism, anti-communism paradigm. They saw the Soviet Union as a positive force. And I think Gorbachev and the people around it didn't realize that by tossing away uh, the Soviet legacy, they actually did a lot of harm, uh, a lot of damage to the rest of the world. And this was a point emphasized by the president of Eritrea who gave a very long presentation in front of Putin uh, and 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 was very critical of uh, Gorbachev and the Soviet leaders around him that yeah you tossed all this aside and you left us in the lurch we looked to you for assistance and you left us in the lurch and that maybe Russia now 
is actually coming back to that um, uh, the, the Soviet tradition, the Soviet tradition of assistance to um, the, the the African people. Well, uh, the Russians are back, but the French are on their way out. Uh, I was looking at a map today of the African countries uh, that have ki literally kicked France out. And now Macron is threatening war. And as we speak, the French embassy in Niger is on fire. Yeah. Yes, it's it's very interesting, and it's interesting how the Western media presented it because the Western media declared that oh, this uh, African summit in Saint Petersburg um, is a big flop because only twenty one heads of state showed up. It doesn't really matter because everybody showed up. I mean, there was no one. If if the West had had his way, no one would have showed up. In fact, everybody showed up to the summit. But at the same time, the, the media have to acknowledge that one after another uh the african countries are getting rid of the uh so-called pro-western regimes and uh and they're replacing them with governments that are hostile uh to france hostile to the united states and well disposed towards russia so it's um we're talking about um niger but what about Mali? That also had a change of government recently uh Burkina Faso uh Chad um, it's, a, it's, it's a whole series of them, and in Sudan, it's a clean sweep across um, Western and Central Africa, and these so-called pro-Western regimes are being uh, thrown aside. So, But let's remember, a lot of it is also the consequence of um, the Western intervention in Libya, which completely destabilized the region, unleashed the uh, Islamic terrorists, uh, so the whole Sahel region was uh, destroyed as a result of that uh, the uh, attack on uh, Gaddafi, and then we had this uh, you know war against Islamists. And as usual, the Americans come in; they don't really do anything. They just simply uh, take the country over, pretend that they're fighting against Islamists, and essentially these governments have now said, "We've had enough. You're not actually doing anything. You're actually weakening us every day. We're losing this war against the Islamists." You need to go. You know, stop giving us this assistance. We act, we can actually do a much better job against Islamic terrorism without United States and without France. Uh, and I, and I think that's really what's contributed to the to this this clean sweep of uh, regimes that have fallen in the last few months. Uh, finally, and I'm grateful for your time, Doctor. Let me go back to uh, the European theatre. Uh, there's intense speculation about the Wagner group, about Prigozhin, uh, who turned up at the St. Petersburg uh, summit, interestingly, uh, and uh, his forces, which uh, are now uh, in Belarus. There's speculation about a Russian-Belarusian creation of a corridor uh, to uh, Russian territory uh, that is effectively separated uh, by a land corridor. Uh, I think it's the Suwalki corridor they are talking about uh, to reinforce it, to, to guard it. And equally, going back to Poland and your earlier point, there's intense speculation that the Polish army will enter Western Ukraine. That would be an act of war against Belarus and Russia, would it not? Yes, no question. I mean, Poland is now kicking up a huge uh, fuss about the the Wagner Group and the Savalki Corridor, and that somehow there's a, a a real there's a threat from the Wagner Group to enter Poland. So that could certainly be uh, a, a danger. I mean, Poland could certainly attack uh, Belarus, saying, "Hey, we're we're under threat from um, the Wagner Group." Um, so I think that there's no question that that's, again, one of the uh, possible ways in which uh, this could escalate into World War III. Um, the Western Ukraine is, a, is certainly a, a possibility if Poland and Ukraine forge some kind of a political union. And I think that's much more likely than just Poland going uh, entering unilaterally. But, you know, they've already talked uh, in the past about creating some kind of a uh, union state. Um, 
And then if, if they do actually create this, some sort of a confederation of uh, Poland and Ukraine, then of course Poland can enter Ukraine. And again, that could well be a, uh, a trigger for uh, World War III. This is, the, this is clearly the plan. I mean, we know that that's, Poland and Ukraine are working in tandem to uh, escalate this into an Article 5 situation. I mean, it happened that time with that the so-called missile that landed in Poland. Remember, Poland and Ukraine both uh, proclaimed that this was an attack on Polish territory when they knew perfectly well that it wasn't. So it wasn't just Ukraine saying it. Poland also said we were under attack from Russia. So Poland and Ukraine are in on it together. Um, um, but again, I think there's a real possibility that, uh, that that Poland and Ukraine will work out some sort of a confederation. And that 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 is in effect makes Ukraine a de facto uh, member of NATO. Um, so I think that that's a, a real possibility. The, the Wagner group, however, I mean, the fact that um, Prigozhin was at this um, St. Petersburg uh, summit, well, the Wagner group is unlike the American, is actually gets the job done in Africa. They have been far more effective in uh, defeating ISIS than the Americans. I mean, the Americans, in, in Africa, as in Syria, they actually don't do anything. They don't actually fight the Islamists. They actually just simply occupy territory, uh, undermine, destabilize governments, but they don't actually get the job done of fighting the Islamists. The Wagner group did do that, which is, I think, why, uh, the, again, many of these African leaders are well disposed towards uh, the Wagner group. Uh, well, you and I have talked about Article 5 before. It doesn't actually mean what most commentators pretend that it means. But in the case no, of, of Poland entering, uh, in the case of Poland entering into Ukraine, that definitely wouldn't trigger uh, Article 5. Uh, because uh, no. if Russia fought Poland in Western Ukraine, it's not fighting Poland, which is a member of NATO, uh, it's fighting this new uh, Hydra-headed entity that may or may not be formed between Poland and Western Ukraine. No, there are, exactly. There are all, all sorts of ways um, in which Poland is going to try and get around it and say, well, this, uh, this uh, involves Article 5. But as you say, Article 5 does not oblige everyone uh, to uh, go to war um, you know, should a, a state come under attack, it just simply obliges all NATO member states to decide uh, what, if anything, they're willing to do about it. But um, more important than Article 5 is Article 1. Article 1 obliges every NATO member state to resolve all issues with non-NATO member states by exclusively peaceful means. Article 1, Article 1 supersedes Article 5. Well, Poland hasn't remotely uh, sought to um, resolve its conflicts with Russia, a non-NATO member state, by peaceful means. And on the contrary, Poland has gone out of its way to provoke a, a war with uh, Russia. So there's no way that Poland can try and invoke Article 5. We're under attack, we're under attack. You know, we, we weren't doing nothing, so please come and help us. There's just no, no way that Poland can make that case.